Today, I wish to talk on the conquest of infections by what I call the microbe hunters. The middle of the 19th century saw a great landmark in the history of man and medicine. The coming into age of the science of bacteriology and microbiology. This science proved that infection was related and caused by microorganisms. The revolution that this caused in medicine continues because as you know, infections still are there, newer infections coming into the world and it is because of the advanced microbiology and bacteriology and virology that we are able to identify these organisms. You must understand what the world was like in the middle of the 19th century. For example, wounds at that time and at that age were often infected. And the infection very often progressed to gangrene, requiring sometimes, more often than not, an amputation of a limb. Hospitals were like charnel houses, stinking with rotten flesh. Surgery was a disaster because post-surgery wounds were often infected. And the commonest cause of death in these individuals was related to infection and to hemorrhage that resulted from infection. And of course, you had various other diseases, smallpox, cholera, plague, typhoid, typhus, all related to infection and all causing great morbidity and mortality. But you'll be surprised to learn that people thought at that time that the cause of all this was miasmas or the inhalation of vapors, of foul vapors, which was responsible for disease. Can you imagine it? And it remained so for a long time until two great men were able to dispel this notion. The first man I'm going to talk to you about showed that it was infection was not due to the presence of poisonous vapors that one inhaled. He did not know what it was due to, but he said it was not due to poisonous vapors. And this is how he came about to make his discovery. I want to speak of a great man, Ignis Thomas Semmelweis. I'm sure you'll forget his name, though I do hope some of you at least may remember it. He was a Hungarian who studied in Vienna, did his gynecology and midwifery, and joined the Kraken House, which was the largest place for obstetrics and gynecology in Europe, as assistant to the then professor, a very distinguished man called Professor Klein. And when he joined the maternity ward, he was astonished to see the tremendous mortality present in mothers who had just delivered their babies. They died of fever and infection and sepsis. It used to be called childbirth fever. Now he noticed that there were two wards in that unit. In one ward, the professor and his unit would manage mothers who had delivered, looked after them delivery and post delivery. And in the other ward, it would be just the midwives who would be looking after mothers, their delivery, and their post-delivery care. And he noticed for some reason or the other that the ward in which the professor and his doctor colleagues were looking after these patients, the mortality was much higher than in those which than in the ward which was managed by the midwives. And he wondered why. He was astonished. And then he made one cute note observation. He noticed that these professors and doctors managing the mothers after delivery, when they first came to the hospital, went first to the autopsy room to do the autopsies of all the mothers who had died previously, and then came to manage the mothers in the ward, whereas the midwives never entered the autopsy room. Therefore, he felt that there was a connection between the high mortality in one ward 
with the autopsy room. Very distressed, he went for a short break. And when, take, when on this short holiday, he was informed that a very dear friend of his had died of a high fever and his autopsy was to be done. He rushed back to Vienna and attended the autopsy of his friend. It so happened that this particular gentleman, this particular doctor, whilst doing an autopsy on a mother who had died of childbirth fever, had accidentally nicked his finger with a scalpel. And following that, he felt very ill and died. So immediately he thought that the infection was carried through the scalpel by, by infection from the mother, from the person who was dead, to the poor man was carried through the scalpel and that was the cause of his death. So he was quite convinced that it was the fact that the professor went first to the autopsy room and then straight to the ward that was responsible for the high mortality. So he insisted that every one doctor who attended his ward should wash his hands thoroughly, should wash his hands not only with soap and water but with calcium chloride and then attend to the patient. And to his astonishment, the mortality in the maternal ward, which was very high, fell to very low levels. He reported this to the Congress in Vienna and when he reported that it was the fact that people didn't wash their hands that was responsible for infection, he drew derision. They all made fun of him and subsequently they made his life so miserable that he had to resign. Resigned he did, very distressed, and he went back to his own country in Budapest, where he again headed a maternity unit. Here again, the mortality was high. Here again, he introduced washing hands thoroughly, dipping them in an antiseptic calcium chloride, making sure that all instruments that were used were dipped in calcium chloride, making sure that every day there was fresh linen provided for the patient's beds, etc. And again, the mortality dropped. Now he writes his book. He writes his book and titles it The Causes, The Concept and The Prevention of Childbirth Fever. It's a big book, scientifically written. Again, it received no attention. Some of the greatest professors, at that time the greatest well-known professor was a man called Professor Firkow. He was a giant in pathology. He said his observations were not correct. The thesis was not correct and he did not believe a word of what was written. It upset him greatly. He went and visited one of his colleagues in Vienna and it was noted that he was not behaving well, that he was seen not only really distressed but not quite well in the head. After a time, they placed him in an asylum and he died there, the cause of which was not quite known. So that was the end of it. It was then realized, many years later, almost 20 years later, that he was right. And that washing hands was the most important thing in the prevention of infection. And it is even more relevant today than what it was at that time. Because in a critical care unit, washing hands before you touch your patient, washing hands after you finish with the patient, most important for the prevention of infection. The unfortunate thing is today many doctors don't even touch their patients. So the question sometimes does not arise. But it's so important to wash hands to prevent infection. So here was a man, you know, who had given, I think, one of the most remarkable service to humanity by a simple observation that washing hands prevented infection. 27 years later, in Budapest, they erected a monument to his memory, posthumous. What a sad thing. What a troubled life this great man led, never being recognized during his lifetime. But then, what can be a greater reward than the, very, than the benefaction that he had given to humanity? 
What could be a greater reward than that? And what more could a man of medicine desire than that? The service that he had done to humanity, it was remarkable. This was Thomas Ignis Semmelweis. I'll tell you now how a great man proved that it was bacteria, organisms which are responsible for infection. His name was Louis Pasteur, one of the greatest Frenchmen ever born. He was born, I think, uh, in the Jura, was in college in Besançois, and studied in the Ecole Supérieure in Paris, studied chemistry, a chemist who benefited humanity and medicine. He studied the polarization of light through tartaric acid crystals and showed that it was the asymmetry in the molecules of the tartaric acid crystals which was responsible for the behavior of light and came to an intuitive conclusion that the difference between living matter and dead matter was that in living matter the molecules were properly arranged whereas in dead matter they were irregularly arranged. He became professor of bacteriology at the University of Strasbourg and then at the University of Lille. And in his inaugural address, he makes a remarkable change, remarkable statement, which I still remember. He said, in the field of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. It's a deep sentence and you should think about it. First, I will give you a brief idea of how he related, how, he, how his studies related to organisms not related to infection. For example, he was able to show that fermentation, which was initially thought to be due to the uh, chemical degradation of yeast, was not really due to that. It was due to microorganisms. Therefore, the souring of wine to vinegar was related to the presence of microorganisms within the wine. The curdling of milk into, into sour milk, shall we say, was due to the presence of organisms within the milk which was responsible for the sour. Many showed what putrefaction was due to. It was believed putrefaction. For example, if you had a piece of meat and left it out for a length of time, it would putrefy. How was it due to? The theory at that time of a Frenchman, also a renowned Frenchman, I can't remember his name now, was that there was a spontaneous occurrence of organisms. Suddenly the organisms came into being. Pasteur said that that was nonsense. Organisms were already there in the atmosphere and it was they that caused, multiplied and caused the putrefaction. In France, you know, when there were disputes like that, two antagonists, protagonists and antagonists discussed their case over an assembly of medical people and this was done, and they thought that Pasteur was right, and the other gentleman was not quite right. And then what else did he do? Then, you know, he did some remarkable things. He was able to show that the curdling, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the souring of wine was due to organism. What happened was that there was a great panic in the country, because all the wine that was being produced was found to be getting bad and they asked Pasteur to find out why. And it showed that it was a particular organism, Mycobacterium acidi, which had infected the wine and which was responsible for this. And what he did was, he just heated the wine to a particular temperature of 50 degrees and this disappeared. And he was able to show that you can therefore sterilize certain liquids by heating them to a particular temperature. He did that for milk, and that's how you have pasteurized milk. And he did that for a number of other liquids also. And that's how the name pasteurization came out from Louis Pasteur. Then there was an outbreak of a kind which destroyed all the silk in the country. He was asked to investigate that again. Here again he found that it was due to an organism, a protozoa, and he showed how you could get rid of it and the silk industry flourished. And now, amazingly, together with two of his other colleagues, he gave 
a proposal, a lecture, a talk, which was absolutely intuitive. And he said from what little he had seen, that each disease was caused by a particular one microorganism. And that if you could identify this microorganism, you could make a vaccine. And if you could make a vaccine, you could prevent this disease. I can't believe you, can't believe it. It was absolutely intuitive because he had not yet made his major studies which are to come. Chicken cholera broke out, where all the chicken died of cholera. So what did he do? He's called again. He identifies the organism. He cultures the organism. He heats the culture to a particular point. Now the organisms producing the chicken cholera are rendered infected. He inoculates the chicken, various chickens now, with this particular ineffective organism and he immunizes them so that they don't get chicken cholera again. And now finally, he makes another great contribution. Anthrax was responsible for a number of deaths of livestock and also of human beings. So he finds out, he knows how anthrax grows. The culture of this is again heated to a particular temperature and the anthrax and the organisms again are not, uh, are not capable of producing any infection. He injects this, this organism which is now deadened for all practical purposes into cattle and he finds that he protects the cattle from anthrax. He makes a great public show of this, this is a remarkable for a, unusual for a genius of a man that he was. He takes 40 sheep, 20 of these have been immunized with the vaccine against anthrax and 20 of them are given anthrax bacilli and he shows that all those who were given the vaccine live and all those you know except for one all those who had not been vaccinated die and then the great final coup de grace his contribution towards rabies vaccine dreadful disease that it was always killed so he started working on that he noticed that the infecting organism was in the saliva of the dog or the animal which bites. He looked at the saliva, he couldn't find the microorganism. No wonder, simply because the microorganism was a virus and you can't see a virus through a normal microscope. Nevertheless, he knew that that is where the infection, the infective organism was. He also noticed that it was present in the spinal cord what does he do now? He injects this virus, this infected material, into the brain of rabbits, one after the other after the other, till the disease is produced in a fixed period of time, fixed incubation period. He called that the virus fixing. Now he injects that into the spinal cord of the rabbit. After the rabbit dies, he dries that spinal cord and he notices that now the particular infective agent that was present is not no longer particularly infected. So he makes solutions of this as a vaccine, starting with the smallest dose and producing, going on to the largest dose, 14 such injections. And he gives them one by one every day to a dog for 14 days and then injects the dog with the actual infected rabies saliva and he finds that the dog survives and he knows that he's come across something which is very great. He does that again and again and the dog survives and anyone who's, if you give it to the dog which is not being given the vaccine, the dog dies immediately of rabies. He shows it to the French Academy and he waits for a human person to come along. And at last it happens. A person called Mr. Meister, a young boy of 14 or 15 who had been mauled by a rabbit dogs, was sent to him miles away. He reaches him almost 10 days after the incident with great trepidation. Pasture uses this vaccine on this boy. 
starting with the small blows, increasing the blows, increasing the blows, every day like this, till on the 14th day, he receives the maximum dose. He waits with bated breath. Can you imagine the turmoil that must have gone on in this man's mind? Not knowing whether this was going to help him or whether it was going to kill him. If he did, the boy developed rabies, it would have been an end to a brilliant career. But he was a man of great courage, strong conviction. He was a man who had a great destiny ahead of him. The boy lived. The boy lived. Sometime later, another person comes, mauled by wolves. Again brought to him in the same manner. He does the same. And again the boy lives. The boy lives. The drama between Meister, Meister, Pasture and his vaccination spreads all over the world. The anti rabic vaccine becomes absolutely worldwide for the protection of rabies and is a great, great, great boon to humanity. He was a great man and he was recognized during his life. Well, they built a huge institute, the Pasture Institute, to honor him, even when he was alive. It was at this Pasteur Institute, by the way, that the, 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 uh, the uh, numerous viruses have been discussed, discovered, including the human immunodeficiency virus, the HIV virus. He gathered around him a large number of great people who carried his name and carried his research forwards. It's amazing that at that time, a newspaper sent out a message or a questionnaire to all its readers. Who would they think was the greatest Frenchman ever? And you'd be surprised that they named Pasteur first, then Napoleon, and then Charlemagne. That was the greatest of the man. These are two great men who have done a lot in medicine. But remember, 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 Pasteur was not a doctor. He was not trained in medicine. He was a chemist. And it was a chemist, therefore, who rendered this service to medicine. And there are many other people who were not trained in the medical profession, who are outside the medical profession, who have also rendered great service 